This short video is about the Mount Pleasant development in North Clerkenwell owned by the now privatised Royal Mail Group. It is one of the largest private developments in the country. To understand the issues affecting the site and why it is so controversial, we have to step back in time. This map from 1754 shows the site outlined in red outside the old city of London amidst fields and farmland that rolled picturesquely into the River Fleet. However, by the mid-18th century this pleasant scene had been transformed by a rubbish tip created by the residents of the swelling city. The stinking heap gave the name Mount Pleasant an ironic twist. Not for the last time in history, this site would be a place of unpleasant designs. By the end of the century this rubbish heap was cleared for the construction of the Middlesex House of Correction, also known as Clerkenwell Jail or Coldbath Fields Prison. The most important factor to shape this site was however not the rubbish tip or the extensive grounds of the House of Correction, but the River Fleet which wound its way through the site from north to south. The river's course follows Phoenix Place, dividing the Mount Pleasant site and forming part of the boundary between present-day Camden and Islington. The fleet not only determines the character of the site, it is also a major factor in why the current proposal submitted by the Royal Mail is deeply flawed. The city's growth soon catches up with Mount Pleasant and by mid-19th century the site has been swallowed up by the industrial expansion of the early Victorian era. By now, it is bounded on all sides by dense housing as the streetscape and urban grain that we know today is starting to emerge. Wilmington Square has been laid out, Farringdon Road, then Guildford Place is formed and Calthorpe Street provides the main east-west connection between what would become Finsbury and Bloomsbury. Note how the course of the fleet has been adjusted slightly in the north. This adjustment will become Pakenham Street. By the end of the century, the site and its surroundings have been completely transformed. The House of Correction has been replaced by the post office. The River Fleet has been covered over to become Pakenham Street and Phoenix Place. Rosebury Avenue has carved its way through the dense houses to the south of the site. As this map reveals, the layout of the site and its surroundings are broadly the same today as they were when this map was drawn in the late 19th century. This aerial photograph shows the similarity in the streetscape between now and a hundred years ago. The Royal Mail Sorting Office dominates the site by its bulk as much as the underused plots of the Royal Mail car parks in the foreground do by their emptiness. If we convert this image into a block plan of the area, we can see that although the area is built up, the general character is defined by a fine urban grain formed by low-rise residential with significant pockets of open space. It should also be noted that the Camden portion of the site is approximately half the size of Islington's. When viewed more widely within the surrounding cityscape, it is obvious that, contrary to various claims, the Mount Pleasant site can never be a new neighbourhood in its own right. The site, because of its historical function and location, is uniquely situated at the nexus of five important established and historic communities – Kings Cross, Lloyd Baker Estate, Clerkenwell, Hatton Garden and Bloomsbury. It is widely acknowledged in planning documents, including the Joint Council Supplementary Planning Document, that these existing communities, their architectural character and urban form, should set a precedent for any new development at Mount Pleasant. Another way of viewing the rich historic, social and architectural character of the area is through the local conservation areas. Mount Pleasant is surrounded by five conservation areas and even forms part of the Rosebury Avenue Conservation Area, the western boundary of which is defined by the former River Fleet. When the Royal Mail first sought to develop the site, a plan was drafted as a basis for the supplementary planning document. The principle of this plan respected these historic, social and physical precedents, acknowledging the largely low-rise residential character with pockets of efficient green space, as evidenced in Granville Square, Lloyd Square, Wilmington Square, the Marjorie Street Estate, Spa Fields and St Andrew's Gardens. Based on this principle, the Mount Pleasant development was a new piece of the city to be sewn seamlessly into the existing fabric. Despite being an awkward hub at the corner of the five established communities and conservation areas, this plan reveals a development proposal that fits sympathetically into the surrounding cityscape. The new buildings are relatively small in size and scale, and separated by a series of smaller open spaces that are made to work hard to give residents and visitors the impression of a low-density community. With the open spaces, the planners have done more with less. A notable flaw dictated by history but neglected by planning and design and further encumbered by modern and inflexible political boundaries is the course of the River Fleet along Phoenix Place, which has been retained as a barrier and an axial thoroughfare. 
Phoenix Place is and will remain a lethal rat run for post office vehicles, white vans and taxis rather than being treated as a once in a multi-generational opportunity for not only improving the overall development and surrounding area, but undoing three centuries of neglect caused by the very river it covers. A different view of this original plan shows how it integrates with the surrounding area making the best use of the established adjacent characteristics to give a sense of identity to each element of the site. Now let's look at the Royal Mail's actual planning application submitted to Islington and Camden councils in June 2013. The Camden site is approximately half the size of the Islington site, yet both have approximately the same number of habitable rooms. Camden site is therefore twice as dense as Islington's. Despite council targets of 50% on new developments, the Royal Mail is offering a minimum of 80% private housing. Mount Pleasant's social housing quota will account for one-third of Islington's annual target of affordable housing and just 11% of Camden's. Aside from facts and figures, let's look at the layout of the proposed buildings and the spaces between them. This diagram shows the relative heights of the buildings in the surrounding neighbourhood. It clearly reveals that the character of the surrounding cityscape is one to four storeys, with a few taller buildings in the four to eight storey range, and the exception just five buildings being eight to twelve storeys. These bigger buildings are not only taller, but generally have a much greater massing effect, especially the ITN offices and the old printing house in Gough Street, and the Holiday Inn on Farringdon Road, which is rightly described in the supplementary planning document as being incongruously scaled. The other two tall buildings, Laystall Court and the former Sirius Fraud Office, have considerably smaller footprints and less of an impact on the skyline and streetscape. If we now look at the Royal Mail's proposal, we can see a different urban grain emerging from the original proposal. The site comprises ten large blocks with fewer breaks and larger public spaces between them. The largest of these spaces is The Garden, an east-west pedestrian route with a misnomer, beaten in its absurdity only by the adjacent meadow that forms the industrial roof over the service ramp that will spew 3,000 Royal Mail vehicles a day onto the already congested Farringdon Road. The Garden is the backbone of this proposal and its rationale is derived from Finsbury's green chain of squares, in which it is meant to be a link, but this is a serious misreading. Finsbury's Georgian squares respond to a Georgian cityscape and cannot be mimicked by The Garden, a bleak concrete precinct overshadowed by a high-rise landscape up to nine storeys high on both sides. With this bland open space the planners have done less with more. Worse still, it is impossible for this ill-conceived arcade to link with anything across Farringdon Road because there is no crossing point. Existing pedestrian crossings exist at the junctions with Rosebury Avenue and Calthorpe Street, making it impossible and impractical for another to be inserted between them. Crossing Farringdon Road at this point, compounded by its position next to the Royal Mail Depot entrance with its 3,000 daily vehicle movements, will be suicide. Let's remind ourselves of the height diagram here. And let's add to this the heights and position of the proposed buildings. The image is startling. Tall buildings should not be a problem per se, but the sheer preponderance of them in this proposal is completely out of keeping with the historic, social and physical character of the surrounding area. Characteristics are acknowledged in the Council's own planning documents, and which the local community has tried desperately and persistently to emphasise to Royal Mail's consultants. Their pleas have fallen on deaf ears. The proposal is made up of predominantly 8 to 12 storey buildings, particularly on the Camden side where they rise to 15 storeys at the southwest corner of the site, encroaching on and looming menacingly over the slither of public land outside the entrance of Christopher Hatton Primary School, a very popular and oversubscribed school at the heart of the local community that neither the architects nor the landscape designers hired by the Royal Mail even knew existed. The Islington side fares little better. The garden, being overshadowed by nine-storey block to the south, will be a gloomy wind tunnel, a pedestrian precinct that leads from nowhere to nowhere. And at the junction of Farringdon Road and Calthorpe Street, the architects have applied Orwellian logic to justify their design for the monstrous nine-storey block opposite Holiday Inn. At this most tricky of junctions, where five roads meet at very different gradients, and over which looms the white elephant of the incongruously scaled Holiday Inn, they've proposed an even more massive block in a bid to conceal Holiday Inn's unsightly mass. This divisive game of architectural conceit masks the commercial imperative of cramming as many units as possible into the available space. And here is what commercially driven architectural mediocrity looks like. 
On the far right is the 15-storey building blocking out the view of the sky from the school children at Christopher Hatton Primary School and the poor people living in the surrounding council housing. The luxury apartments along Gough Street will have for their view the computer terminals of the hacks inside the ITN building, just metres from their window. The density of the Camden side of the site is obvious and incongruous. The only significant piece of green space is the meadow, which is off-limits and not included in the development, a nice little nest egg for the Royal Mail to develop at a later date. The Islington side fares little better, the blocks dwarfing the Victorian terraces of Farringdon Road, creating a canyon along Calthorpe Street and casting the already appalling junction with Farringdon Road in permanent darkness. What this model reveals more than anything is how little it integrates with the five established communities. The development is like a fortress. It turns its back on the surrounding landscape and sticks two fingers up to those that live around it. The development is led by those buying into it rather than those outside it. Now that the Royal Mail has been sold, the land is no longer even public. A private company will manage this site, with private security deciding who can gain entry and private maintenance firms maintaining the privatised public realm. How long will it be before private investors grow tired of their service charges being spent on infrastructure, street furniture and play areas used by the public? How long before the gates go up and the public are shut out? A form of architectural apartheid already ensures that the social housing elements are separated physically and aesthetically from their private neighbours. There are those that may object to any form of social housing provision in prime central London locations, but history, experience and common sense show that diverse communities are the healthiest and the happiest. Human beings are social animals and the creation of our cities is our greatest achievement. Carving them up for the exclusive use of any sector of society, wealthy or poor, is self-defeating. Architects love computer renderings because they project an idealised image of their plans that can never become reality, but may win them work. Since we cannot reasonably know exactly what these buildings will look like at this early stage, here are some before and after shots to illustrate what we do know, the massing and heights of the proposed buildings. Here is the dire five-way junction where Farrington Road, Calthorpe Street, Marjorie Street and Lloyd Baker Street converge, and over which looms the white elephant of Holiday Inn. And this is what is proposed. The block, in its futile bid to conceal Holiday Inn, creates a canyon of Calthorpe Street. Here's the same junction highlighted in the supplementary planning document as needing special design consideration. And this is what the architects propose. The block completely overshadows this corner throughout much of the day and much of the year. Here's the view from Calthorpe Street. The incongruously scaled development will cast a shadow over this road for most of the day. Here's Gough Street, behind ITN. And here's how the massing will appear when the 8 to 15 storey blocks are built. Here's the view from Christopher Hatton Primary School. The 10-storey Laystall Court is on the right. And this is the 15-storey building that is being proposed. And just to give an example of how the architects represent these schemes to the general public, this is their drawing for that 15-storey block. It's not only partly concealed behind mature trees in full leaf that don't exist, but is also drawn to appear much lower than it would be in relation to the 10-storey Laystall Court opposite. This is a lie, and architects are experts at this when selling their rosy plans. Here are some images that reveal the architectural character of the proposed buildings. Given the noted historic, social and architectural character of the area, it is a travesty that any trained architect could be satisfied with such insipid proposals. In this view, along Phoenix Place and the former course of the River Fleet, Royal Mail vehicles, white vans and taxis that hurtle along this rat run have been replaced with a row of pretty trees. It's another lie. Islington and Camden councils determined that the Royal Mail had no obligation to provide for schools, doctor's surgeries or any public amenities. It was claimed that the surrounding community was sufficiently well stocked. While the private residents, by into their exclusive site, can afford to turn their backs on the surrounding community, they will inevitably need to embrace it when they fall ill, or wish to relax in a park, or need to educate their children. This is an unfair deal. The existing community and its amenities can afford to be ignored by design, but will carry the burden of the extra 1,500 to 2,000 residents expected to populate this site. This year, Christopher Hatton Primary School had 63 children on its waiting list for a reception class. An eight-year campaign to have a local secondary school serving the diverse community south of the Euston Road is close to securing a site on the north boundary of this development at Wren Street to be opened in 2015. This slide reveals the results of a recent parent survey to measure the demand for the proposed school. 
Each red tag represents a child currently in year four and five whose parents would like them to attend the school. The Mount Pleasant site is conspicuous by the hole it forms amidst the existing population. Based on the survey's findings, this four-form entry school would be oversubscribed before it's even built. When this hole is filled by housing and the anticipated 212 children living on the new development need educating, they will place an even greater burden on the already strained services. Yet Royal Mail is not expected to contribute one penny towards providing or even supplementing these services. The same applies to GPs, dentists, sports facilities and open spaces. In summing up, we would like to offer an alternative. Here is a diagram produced by the architect planner Mike Franks of the Mount Pleasant Forum that illustrates the characteristics of this extraordinary site. We can see the River Fleet winding its way from north to south which created the site's physical character. We can see in the purple stars the obstacles around the site which mass towards the southwest corner. We can see the flashpoints where traffic and an accumulation of poor design over the centuries have created backlands and dangerous urban spaces. We can see the four corners of the site, which are emphasised in the supplementary planning document as being crucial to the success of the proposal. And we can see the east-west axis, which forms the backbone of the proposal along the garden. This second diagram isolates the major problems that confront the site, problems caused by natural and man-made conditions over centuries. The river fleet, with its steep slopes tumbling into this filthy ditch, was a natural barrier between East and West London when it expanded in the late 18th century and has since been a terrible scar on this landscape. Compounding this natural problem has been the imposition of major arterial routes during the 19th century, including what is now Farringdon Road, which the Metropolitan Line, the world's first underground railway, followed. The result over time has been a site that the surrounding area has turned its back on. A truly successful development would seek to remedy these historical wounds and knit the site back into the fabric of the cityscape. And finally, this diagram presents an alternative scheme that we feel offers a more logical, practical and sensible basis for beginning a discussion about the development of this site, and which, if realised, would not only benefit the wider community, but deliver more profit to the Royal Mail shareholders by investing in a genuinely desirable and prime piece of real estate. The principle of this scheme draws on the one element of this site that has had the most influential and often damaging impact on the site, the River Fleet. In this scheme, the backbone is a linear park running in a north-south direction. Phoenix Place, the river's former course, would be transformed into a green corridor through the site, obtaining valuable land from the treacherous rat run that it currently is, and taking nothing from the land for housing. It would also form a natural route between the two schools, one primary and one new secondary, that will inevitably serve the site. This green corridor would extend northwards beyond the site to include the proposed new secondary school and southwards to link up with the new crossrail site at Farringdon. Yes, it follows the line of the council boundary and therefore is beyond the ability of some bureaucrats to contemplate, but if we step out from our blinkered way of compartmentalising everything in life, then this is a once-in-a-multi-generational opportunity and we must not waste such a chance. The equally dangerous rat run that is Elm Street and Mount Pleasant, forming the southern boundary of the site, could also be closed off to all but emergency traffic, creating a pedestrian piazza on the triangle of land between the development and Christopher Hatton Primary School. This would turn what is currently a nightmare on Elm Street into a dream come true not only for parents, children and residents, but also for the private tenants buying into this corner of the new development. And of the opposite corner, next to Holiday Inn, a much more sensitive study aimed at calming not only the traffic but also the buildings around this junction is needed. A pedestrian route into the site from this corner would break up the presently monumental block. Charles Simmons' house on the opposite side of Farrington Road is about to be demolished, so why don't the architects talk to one another and come up with a scheme that complements the entire surroundings? Another once in a multi-generational opportunity to be seized, not squandered. We're calling on the council officers to be bold and stand up to the Royal Mail by rejecting this planning application and demand that they learn from the work that has been done, revisit some of the early principles that respected the site's historic, social and physical precedents, and acknowledge the largely low-rise residential character with pockets of highly efficient green spaces. And finally, we call upon councillors, planning officers and the Royal Mail and its legions of anonymous consultants and experts to embrace the knowledge that exists in the local communities and listen not just to their concerns, but to the wisdom born from experience that exists in every local community.
For many local residents, Mount Pleasant has exposed the harsh realities of large private developments and their negative impact on established and often fragile inner city neighbourhoods. For most, they want this development to feel part of their community as much as they expect the new residents to want to be part of it. The alternative is for wealthy investors to isolate themselves from the world in gated communities and erode the societies that sustain them. Like a cancer, these dynamic but ultimately selfish entities are counterproductive because they will kill the host that supports them, the towns and cities that we once owned. Surely more than enough money has been made in the controversially cheap sale of the Royal Mail for commercial interests not to dominate the development of this huge slice of our capital. The land has already been taken from the public. Don't allow the property to go the same way while blighting the communities surrounding it. If you have any questions about the development, please do get in touch with the Mount Pleasant Forum and please, please contact your local councillors and your local planning officers to oppose this development. Demand something that serves not only private investors, but also the public's needs now and for generations to come.